scoot up for a second and let's talk. Yo, DJ, throw that beautiful champagne footage. Champagne gang, fizz fam, confidant. <laughs> Welcome to the chalet for the secrets spill. If this is your first time here, hi, I'm the Empress, and you are joining me for grown discussions and bubbly banter. Over here, we give classy with a twist, huh? A little clink with chaos with a side of charm. So if you're ready to sip, savor, and spill, Baby, come on in. Make sure you grab one of those drinks off the table. Say hi to a few people. Kick your feet up on one of those chase loungers over there. And get comfortable because today we're about to have a little fun. Listen, we've all said that we wish we had our own little place to escape to, right? What if I told you you can create your own space? And you can do it with something called a micro nation. So we're about to get into it. But first, raise those glasses in the air. It's time for our dose of empowerment. Are you ready? Today we're going to talk about finding peace. Finding your peace is like discovering a quiet sanctuary within yourself where the noise of the world fades away and all that remains is the steady rhythm of your heartbeat. It's a place where you can breathe deeply, free from the weight of worry and the chaos of life. In this sacred space, you reconnect with your true self, embracing the calm that comes from knowing you are exactly where you need to be. Peace is not something others can give to you. It's something you cultivate within. It's in the moments when you choose to let go of what no longer serves you, when you release the need to control, and when you trust the journey ahead. It's in the stillness where clarity emerges, and you realize that everything you need is already inside you. Now repeat after me. I am a beacon of peace and serenity. I trust my inner strength and I let go of what no longer serves me. My heart is calm, my mind is clear, and I am at peace with myself and the world around me. Let's toast. So now, I ran into this perusing the streets of YouTube and I was so intrigued that right here in the United States, we have micro nations. I didn't know what they were, but they're basically these little nations that are established within an already established country. Some of them are much closer than you think. For example, Illinois has 13 micro nations. Nevada has one. California has about 13 as well. So I was thinking, we're constantly talking about needing to create our own space with our own money, etc. Because we are tired. We're tired of the way things are being run in this country. So what if we could create or develop a micro nation? Something especially created by us for us, governed by us. Interesting, right? Well, it's a lot more interesting than you think. Let's take a look at these videos on micronations and tell me in the comments what you think about it. And while you're watching, I need you to do me a favor. If we decided that we wanted to develop a micronation for our champagne gang and our fizz fam, what would we name it? What would the colors be? Some of these micronations have some very interesting names. <laughs> so drop in the comments and tell me what would the name of our secrets micronation be? Let's have some fun with this one because who knows, we may just become our own nation. <laughs> Think about it while you're watching these videos and let's chat. This may not be live, but I'm always in the comments during every premiere and I'll be watching the comments for the replay game. So let's get into it. The Republic of Malaysia. I'm King George II, current ruler of Slobovia, and one of the founding members. My name is Dr. Eric Liss. I am the unquestioned tyrannical dictator of the Arakan Empire. If you don't remember any of these countries from geography class, you're not alone. They're all micro nations, self declared sovereign states not formally recognized by the countries in which they reside. Thank you. 
This summer, representatives from 27 micronations gathered for a summit in Dunwoody, Georgia. Say micronation. Micronation. <laughs> Our governing philosophy is absolute monarchy based upon divine right theory. And I have over 200 citizens who tend to agree with it. I don't think it makes us exactly a cult, but... <laughs> Your Majesty. Jean-Pierre. Oh. You're the new lieutenant? I love your outfit. That one's wonderful. I can give the tour of the house if anybody wants it. Ruritania is, and all micronations for that matter, are more of a political statement than an ideology. We don't care for the way things are going in the countries we come from. And we think we could do a better job, even if it's just over a postage stamp sized piece of property. Micronations came to prominence in the 1960s, when two man-made islands declared their independence. The Republic of Rose Island, off the coast of Italy, and Sealand, off the coast of the UK. The Italian government did not take kindly to Rose Island, and in 1968, they sent forces who demolished it with explosives. Sealand fared better, surviving a hostage situation and legal troubles ranging from passport fraud to money laundering. Other micronations were founded with a wide variety of goals, including establishing a libertarian utopia, creating a matriarchal BDSM state, and circumventing drug laws. Many of these had less than ideal outcomes. However, the majority went unnoticed by society until the 90s, when previously isolated micronationalists realized they weren't alone. I wasn't even aware that there were other micronations out there uh, until the advent of the internet. You know, you get out there and start looking around like, whoa, that guy's got his own country, he declared. That guy's got his own country. Your Majesties, Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. My country is an anti-state. We now consider ourselves to be a class war republic. Money. What is it anyway? Britannia has had a long tradition against the vile vermin of squirrels. Most of my citizens never even meet me. They send in the application. I approve it. We also get a lot of people trying desperately to leave third world countries. They think that we're a country with enough land that they could move here. We can give them a citizenship, but it comes without residency. There are absolutely no tangible benefits to being a member of the American Empire. It is purely something that someone can be happy about. Naturally, we do sell banknotes and coins and printable passports and citizenship certificates. But really, it's not a question of tangible benefit. It's a question of just belonging. And when you get right down to it, that's really one of the most powerful things in the world. Our land claim is actually only uh, the size of a small rock. It's right here in this box. And it weighs roughly about two pounds. Many micronationalists are not isolationists. They also want to shape the world around them and question what makes a state legitimate. For them, even small acts of rebellion help challenge bureaucracies and give them control over their own lives. Some people describe it as role playing. Micronations actually hate that. This is more of a lifestyle. And special recognition of your services, my special gift to you. I am honored. My husband was an invalid for a number of years. He came up with laws and rules that we still use. When he passed away, we got about a hundred condolence letters from other micronations. I spent 10 years being a caregiver. Suddenly, I didn't know what to do with myself. This fills my time. Thank you. <laughs> When I'm not being the queen, I'm being what other people want me to be. When I'm being the queen, I'm who I want to be. Since 1850, California has laid claim to this portion of the Colorado desert. And since 1907, this sandy soil has been a part of Imperial County. But on February 6, 2022, a new micronation was born on an 11.7-acre plot of land sandwiched in between Ocotella Wells and Westmoreland. Welcome to the United Territories of the Sovereign Nation of the People's Republic of Slojamistan. 
Getting inside Slow Jamistan is not easy. Security of Special Forces. Eh, uh, I will need you on that side. The border's heavily guarded, and there's a strict dress code for anyone who wants to enter. Nobody is wearing crocs, right? If you are wearing crocs, you do not come into Sloyamastan today. <laughs> Once visitors are given a visa, the Sultan of Slow Jamistan welcomes everyone with a speech. Many of you watching today probably ask yourself, just what is Slow Jamistan? It's a very long speech. We have many visions for the future. Some are very big and grand, some are small and conservative. A bowling alley, a Korean barbecue restaurant, an armadillo farm. Like many others here on this day, I was confused by the Sultan's speech, so I requested a sit-down interview in his Oval Office. Slow Jamistan, what is your guys' beliefs here? Why are you a, are you a peaceful nation? We are absolutely a, a peace-loving nation. There are only a few things that uh, we don't like, and hate is a strong word. I'll, I'll use the word hate. We hate uh, Crocs, uh, the shoes, the uh, silly shoes with the, uh, the rubber, with the holes. I quickly learned that the Sultan's hatred for Crocs runs so deep that he's gone to great lengths to protect his nation from intruders wearing them. Landmines being just one of the deterrents. They are confetti landmines. They shoot confetti and also Mexican candy. Have you had the Mexican candy with the chili inside? I have. First it's sweet, then it's very spicy. Surprise! So, Despite what the Sultan will tell you, there's not much to protect in Slow Jamistan. The sand is the nation's main export. The Slow Jamistan River can't really sustain any crops, and if you look at the country's financial report, you'll understand why the Sultan relies on his American job to keep the country afloat. So my job for money is the radio DJ, and I do a show called Sunday Night Slow Jams. It airs all across America, 200 radio stations, including Sacramento. And therein lies the first bit of real truth. The Sultan is actually radio host Randy Williams. And the next bit of truth, Randy is a world traveler. My goal, my mission in life, is to see all 193 countries in the world. There are 193. Currently today, I am at 175. Randy would have seen all 193 countries by now had the pandemic not stopped his travels. Like the rest of us, he was grounded. So basically, short story, I ran out of countries, so I made my own. Slow Jamistan is more than just a patch of sand to Randy. It's more than just a fun talking point on his radio show. And it's more than just a protective refuge for the Slow Jamistani raccoons. Is this a taco? This is a taco, yes. Do not feed the raccoons tacos or anything else. Slow Jamistan! Slow Jamistan is a safe haven, a pandemic-friendly place in the middle of the desert where Americans can travel outside the country safely. That is the headline. You can print that. He ran out of countries, he made his own. Why do people come to Reno? Well, first there's gambling, maybe a visit to Lake Tahoe, but there's one attraction you probably don't know about. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you. So Chief Constable. Well, nice to meet you. First lady. Nice, nice to, to meet you. you as well. So am I on U.S. soil right you now? You are actually now you are in Malasia right I'm now. I'm in Malasia. Absolutely. The Republic of Malasia, to be exact. Once you land in Reno, it's a 56-minute drive through winding and really nerve-wracking roads through the desert to visit this micronation. What's a micronation? Micronation is basically a tiny self-declared nation usually not recognized by any other country. What should I refer to you as? I am His Excellency the President. Most Americans are most comfortable with Mr. President. Malasi was originally founded in 1977. My friend James and I saw an old movie called The Mouse That Roared. Why is the smallest country on earth declaring war against the United States? We were inspired to start our own country. So these are all other micronations. Yeah, uh -huh. New Zealand, this one's in Canada, Western Australia, way out in the middle of nowhere. A lot of folks start their own micronations. There's hundreds of micronations out there. You can pretty much stop with picking a flag and declaring yourself to be the king, and that's it. His Excellency says he spent $10,000 to build this nation right in his own backyard. And he's not alone. He just returned from Microcon. It's like Comic-Con, but for micronations. Of course, they always want to establish diplomatic relations, which we don't do that. Oh, no. We don't do that. We're not involved in diplomacy. But the country does welcome tourists. About 100 stop by every year to see the country's bank, general store, 
and space yeah, program. See the rockets, right? Nice. Woo! Go. Uh, we have 28 total citizens of Malasia resident here in the country. We have five canine citizens and uh, six humans. The rest are expatriates living out, outside the country in the U.S. I love it so much. Do you think I guess no? No, I'm sorry, huh? It's a family nation. This is the geographical center of our country. And so from here, you can also see the northeast corner of our nation. I know what you're thinking. Folks might think it's a joke, but um, most folks are kind of in on the joke, and it's okay. It's not a joke, though. It's fun. It's not a joke. Not a joke. We're serious about having our own country. But it is a joke. No, it's not, it's a, not a joke. Not a joke. Not a joke. Okay. Either way, it's fun. I played along because why not? When am I ever going to be in Malasia again? All right, so this is uh, one of the last stops on the tour. This is the famous pineapple fountain. You can pick a coin. If you take the coin and throw it over your shoulder, and if it lands in the fountain, you will come back to Malasia. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Woo! I'll be back. Amazing skills. <laughs> you see that? That was amazing. The purpose of Atlantium is to give people a vision of how a globalized world could properly function, in which everyone has the possibility of realizing the fullness of their personal potential. What do you do if you don't like the country you were born in? Micronations are countries that have declared independence from their host nation. They aren't recognized by the rest. His Imperial Majesty, George II, the Emperor of Atlantium. <laughs> Welcome to Atlantium. Atlantium is a global sovereign state and it also happens to be the smallest country in Australia. Our headquarters in New South Wales is 0.76 square kilometres in extent. Putting that in context, we are about twice the size of Vatican City and half the size of Monaco. Over there, in the centre of Atlantium, is Constitution Hill and off to the right is Flagstaff Hill. And beyond those farthest trees is another country, Australia. Atlantium was founded on the 27th of November 1981 by me and my two cousins, Geoffrey and Claire. And Atlantium's territory at that time was a corner of my mother's backyard. It then grew over the next few years to encompass some of my university friends. And they were quite taken by the idea and they became the first new citizens from outside my immediate family. The government started expanding, we started codifying and documenting our activities a lot more widely. The internet came along and we had an explosion of interest, which has never really stopped. My name is Ed Collingham. My main role is flag bearer in front of the vehicle in parades and also bodyguard and general aide de camp because there's a lot to do for emperors prior to formal engagements. Good enough. <laughs> We've had a fair amount of international media coverage over the years, and typically the stories take a fairly light-hearted tone, but they do provide me with a vehicle for getting out a serious message to the people interviewing me from time to time. We support assisted suicide, marriage equality, abortion rights, and unrestricted international freedom of movement. The world that Atlantean wants to see is one where people can realise the fullness of their personal potential. We have in excess of 3,000 citizens in around 100 countries, everywhere from Morocco to Azerbaijan to Zimbabwe. We say, throw open the borders. Our economy will benefit, our society will benefit, and humanity's future will benefit. People are usually approved as citizens through a simple online process, but on rare occasions, I do induct citizens personally. Atlantium has its own coins, banknotes, and monetary system. We even have our own national anthem, the Auroran Hymn. It's an excerpt from the third movement of Saint-Saëns' Symphony No. 3 in C, which everybody knows. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da
We did have an issue back in the early 1980s when some mail was returned to us by an official representative. There was a bit of a standoff on my mother's front veranda. I refused to take it back. My mother took it back out of embarrassment. My parents raised me with the idea that in this country, with the right amount of intelligence and application, you can really achieve anything. They also taught me that if you didn't like the way the world was, you should actively do something about it. And 35 years later, Atlantium has grown into a global organisation where my vision is now shared by thousands of people around the world. And not many people have that opportunity in life. If through Atlantium I can contribute in some small way to that hope for bright future of humanity, then I will go to my grave a happy man. For many things, including the Lord of the Rings films and an alleged affinity for sheep. But chief among the things New Zealand is known for is rugby. On the North Island of New Zealand, just a two-hour drive from Mount Doom, sits the hamlet of Wangamonoma. In 1989, Wangamonoma was within the region of Taranaki and proudly supported their regional rugby team, the Taranaki Bulls, while vehemently despising their regional neighbors, Manawatu. However, a seismic change would hit the area when the New Zealand government redrew the regional borders, moving Wangamonoma from the Taranaki region into the Manawatu Wanganui region. Wangamonians were not happy. They were not, and could never be, manwangers. So on November 1st, a meeting was called at a local hotel, and the townspeople declared themselves the Republic of Wangamonoma, separating themselves not only from Manawatu Wanganui, but the entire country of New Zealand. This day would go down as the first of many Republic days in the new nation of Wangamonoma. Any respectable micronation needs a president, so the people elected Ian Jestrup, despite the fact that he wasn't even aware of his presence on the ballot. Wangamamonians would continue using Republic Day as their election day, holding one every other summer. Word of this quirky nation began to spread throughout the North Island, and crowds of people began arriving in Wangamonoma for the Republic Day festivities. President Jestrup capitalized on this by using the Republic Days as a fundraiser for the town's school. Jestrup served five terms as president, and then things got weird. The election of 1999 featured two contenders, Peter Ray and Billy Gumboot. Billy went on to win in a landslide, but whispers of election fraud began to rise with rumors that Billy had skewed the results by eating all of the ballots. Oh yeah, did I mention that Billy Gumboot was a goat? Election fraud or not, a goat named Billy would serve as Wangamonoma's president for 18 months until his tragic and controversial death. Some conspiracy theorists believe that his death was the result of eating poisoned grass, but no evidence of this exists. On Republic Day 2001, Wangamamonians elected their third president, Ty the Poodle. Tragedy again struck the presidency when Ty was attacked by a mastiff in what many in the area referred to as an assassination attempt. Ty would survive the attack, but was left mentally unfit to serve as a result, leaving his owners to see out his turn. The 2005 election was a contentious one that saw three contenders, including the first president of Wangamonoma, Ian Jestrup. The rest of the field included a cross-dresser named Miriam and Mert Myrtle the Turtle Kennard. Miriam's cross-dressing did not play well with the conservative electorate, and Ian Jestrup was far too establishment, allowing the populist candidate, Myrtle the Turtle, to emerge as the winner. And, oh yeah, Myrtle the Turtle was actually a human. The popular garage owner would go on to be re-elected in 2007, 2009, 2011, and 2013. The Turtle, as he was affectionately referred to by Wanga Mamonians, became ill in his final terms, and on October 25, 2015, passed away at New Plymouth Hospice. Days before his death, the beloved president was honored with a knighthood from the Republic of Wangamonoma, the first and only in its short history. A few months later, Republic Day arrived and Wangamamonia elected their first female and third human president, local pub owner, Vicki Pratt. On January 21st, 2017, visitors descended on the tiny Republic of Wangamonoma for Republic Day, where they bought the required $3 passport at the border to become an honorary citizen of the micronation. The incumbent Vicki Pratt sought her second term. A local rugby coach threw his hat in the ring. A man named Granddad John Hurley was nominated by his grandchildren. And a frequenter of the local pub, Ted, the cat, rounded out the ballot. The crowd proved too intimidating for Ted, who kept to himself most of the day, which helped pave the way for Granddad John's surprising victory and rise to president of Wangamonoma. In two years, the little New Zealand Republic will reset and hold another election, which, who knows, could be won by someone watching this video or maybe even one of their pets. In 1982, the United States won a war that lasted less than a minute. The war had zero casualties, and only one person was actually attacked, by a piece of stale bread. For the Florida Keys, there is one way in and one way out, Highway 1. 
Any disruption on this highway can have major ramifications for the rest of the archipelago. Such was the case in 1982, when the United States Border Control set up a blockade near Skeeter's Last Chance Saloon in Florida City, bringing traffic on Route 1 to a virtual halt. Anyone leaving the Keys would be required to go through customs as though they were entering a new country, and were also subjected to having their vehicles searched for illegal drugs. Officials in the Florida Keys found this unacceptable for two reasons. One, it forced American citizens traveling from one part of America into another part of America to prove that they were Americans. And two, it made the only artery to and from the mainland of Florida nearly impassable, discouraging tourists from visiting the area. The mayor of Key West, Dennis Wardlow, became so agitated by the existence of this border blockade that he decided that if the United States was going to treat the Florida Keys as a foreign nation, then he would make it one. At exactly noon on April 23, 1982, Wardlow read aloud a declaration of secession and proclaimed the Florida Keys the Conch Republic. He then immediately declared war on the United States and followed through on this declaration by breaking a piece of stale Cuban bread over the head of a United States naval officer. After carrying out this attack, the Conch Republic surrendered and requested $1 billion in foreign aid to make up for the loss in tourism revenue caused by the blockade. The request for aid was more or less ignored, but a clear message was sent, and shortly after, the blockade was lifted. In September of 95, the Secretary General of the Conch Republic, Peter Anderson, heard news that the 478th Civil Affairs Battalion of the United States Army Reserve was planning on conducting a training exercise at Key West. The exercise was to simulate the invasion of a foreign island by landing on Key West as though it were not part of the United States, which, according to the Conch Republic, it wasn't. Because they had not been notified, the Conch Republic government protested to President Clinton, the Joint Chiefs, and the Secretary of State. However, despite these letters of protest, the 478th moved forward with the attack, and their act of simulating the invasion of a foreign land became a reality. They responded to the invasion by mobilizing for a full-scale war, which, in Conch Republic terms, meant firing water cannons from fireboats and hitting people with, you guessed it, stale Cuban bread. The 478th was forced to call off their exercise and issued a formal apology, saying that they in no way meant to challenge or impugn the sovereignty of the Conch Republic. The invasion instead became a friendly diplomatic visit, and the Conch Republic had finally received the recognition it felt it deserved. Despite their run-ins with the United States government, the Conch Republic seeks to only be friendly with the United States. Citizens consider themselves not only citizens of the Conch Republic, but also Americans. One motto of the Conch Republic is the mitigation of world tension through the exercise of humor. And this micronation is committed to bringing more humor, warmth, and respect to a world in need of all three. But if you happen to pose a threat to the sovereign Conch Republic, you can almost guarantee that a piece of stale Cuban bread is headed your direction. For over a decade, Australia has been at war. Not with terrorism, not with drugs, not with Christmas, but with the gay and lesbian kingdom of the Coral Sea Islands. In 2004, Australia passed a controversial piece of legislation that defined marriage as the union of a man and a woman, explicitly saying that a union between a man and a man or a woman and a woman must not be recognized as marriage. The act also mandated that same-sex marriages conducted outside of Australia are also invalid, even if they occur in countries where same-sex marriage is legal. Meanwhile, at the 2004 Brisbane Gay Pride Festival, a group of gay rights activists decided that they had had enough with Australia's policy towards same-sex marriage. They set sail in a vessel named the Gay Flower and planted their flag 200 nautical miles off Australia's coast on Cato Island, a small island in the Coral Sea Islands territory. Upon landing on the island, the activists claimed the Coral Sea Islands territory as their own, declared independence from Australia, proclaimed themselves the gay and lesbian kingdom, and elected Dale Parker Anderson as their emperor. Emperor Dale I claims to be a direct descendant of King Edward II of England, who, coincidentally, historians believe to have been a homosexual. Also, this makes Emperor Dale a distant relative of all the major royal houses of Europe. Underwhelmed by Australia's reaction to their declaration of independence, the kingdom declared war on Australia, a declaration which made it to the desk of Prime Minister John Howard both directly and also by way of the government of Switzerland. But is their claim to independence legitimate? In order to understand that, we have to know a little bit more about the Coral Sea Islands. The Coral Sea Island Territory is recognized as an external overseas territory of Australia by the Australian government and all the governments of UN member nations. Under United Nations and international law, overseas territories of all governments have the legal right to self-government and self-determination if they are to become oppressed. Given that law, it would appear that the 30-plus islands that make up the Coral Sea Islands territory possess the right to self-government. However, when I say island, I'm not exactly talking about Puerto Rico. I'm talking about tiny, uninhabited specks of sand in the middle of the Great Barrier Reef. 
In fact, only one island in the territory, Willis Island, is considered to be inhabited, with its booming population of four. Even Cato Island, home of the Gay and Lesbian Kingdom, cannot claim to be populated. As a result, the Gay and Lesbian Kingdom has instead served as a symbol of the gay rights movement for over a decade. In that time, they've also generated some revenue, selling their very own commemorative postage stamps. In 2013, the kingdom's existence was nearly rendered obsolete when Australia legalized same-sex marriage. This was short-lived, however, when the High Court overruled the decision five days later, invalidating all of the marriages that took place while it was legal. Today, same-sex marriage continues to be a contentious topic in Australian politics, but as long as same-sex marriage is not recognized in Australia, you can be assured that the gay and lesbian kingdom of the Coral Sea Islands will be at war with Australia. On July 15, 1997, Fashion designer Gianni Versace was shot and killed on the steps of his Miami Beach mansion by one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives. Days later, a car was found containing some of the personal effects of the killer, including a passport from the Principality of Sealand, a country no one even knew existed. Or was Sealand even a country to begin with? During World War II, the United Kingdom built a series of forts in the North Sea in an attempt to defend vital shipping lanes against the Germans. What on July 15, 1997, fashion designer Gianni Versace was shot and killed on the steps of his Miami Beach mansion by one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives. Days later, a car was found containing some of the personal effects of the killer, including a passport from the Principality of Sealand, a country no one even knew existed. Or was Sealand even a country to begin with? During World War II, the United Kingdom built a series of forts in the North Sea in an attempt to defend vital shipping lanes against the Germans. One such fort, Ruff's Tower, was erected roughly seven nautical miles off the coast of Suffolk. Fast forward to the 1960s, the forts had been vacated by the government, making them available to radio DJs trying to meet a growing demand for pop and rock music not being catered to by BBC Radio. Two of these so-called radio pirates, Patty Roy Bates, operator of Radio Essex, and Ronan O'Reilly, operator of Radio Caroline, began occupying Ruff's Tower. Differences between the two emerged, however, and Bates seized the tower as his own. Members of Radio Caroline then attempted to take back the fort, but Bates and his crew held the fort with guns and Molotov cocktails. Following the attack, Bates and his family decided to permanently relocate to Ruff's Tower. However, before they could even finish decorating their new home, a ship carrying British Royal Marines ordered Bates to surrender and vacate the fort. Bates refused and established his own nation on Ruff's Tower. On September 2nd, 1967, Bates declared independence and the Principality of Sealand was born. Sadly, this Declaration of Independence was largely ignored until a year later when Roy's 15-year-old son Michael fired warning shots at workmen who were servicing a navigational buoy near the platform. The next time Roy and his son Michael set foot on the mainland of the United Kingdom, they were arrested on weapons charges. However, British territorial claim at the time was judged by how far a cannon could shoot from land into the North Sea, in this case, three nautical miles. Since Sealand was more than twice that distance away from the mainland, the court ruled that the fort laid outside of the United Kingdom's jurisdiction jurisdiction, and thus the case could not proceed. So that's it. Sealand's a country, right? Well, not exactly. Many micronations like Sealand cite the 1933 Montevideo Convention when attempting to legitimize their sovereignty. This convention came up with four criteria for legitimate nations, a permanent population, a defined territory, a government, and a capacity to enter into relations with other states. Sealand has the Bates family as a permanent population, Ruff's Tower as a defined territory, and Roy Bates has also established some semblance of a government on the structure. The tricky one, and the one that often trips nations up, is number four. In August 1978, the self-proclaimed Prime Minister of Sealand, Alexander Achenbach hired German and Dutch mercenaries to attack Sealand while Roy Bates and his wife were in England. Achenbach and the mercenaries stormed the fort with speedboats, jet skis, and helicopters and took Michael Bates hostage. However, Michael was able to use weapons stashed on the platform to escape and retake the fort, capturing Achenbach and his mercenaries. Achenbach, a holder of a Sealand passport, was charged with treason and was held on the fort as a prisoner unless he agreed to pay the Bates family $35,000. The governments of the Netherlands, Austria, and Germany petitioned the United Kingdom for the release of the German citizen, but the UK denied the request, citing the 1968 case which ruled that Sealand was outside of their jurisdiction. Germany then sent a diplomat from their embassy in London to Sealand to negotiate the release of Achenbach, a gesture in which the Bates family claims proves their capacity to enter in relations with other states, while also proving Germany's recognition of Sealand as a sovereign nation. So, the UK conceded that Sealand was outside of their jurisdiction, Sealand fulfills the four requirements of the Montevideo Convention and has de facto recognition from Germany. Now it's a country, right? 
Again, not really. The sad truth is that no one really cares about the Montevideo Convention. Whether or not a nation's sovereignty is recognized comes down to whether or not other recognized countries recognize them. To date, despite the 1968 court case and the negotiations with the German diplomat, no country recognizes Sealand as a country, and therefore, it is not a country. In 1987, the UK extended its territorial waters from 3 nautical miles to 12 nautical miles, thus including Ruff's Tower within its jurisdiction. However, despite this lack of recognition, the Bates family has stood by the fact that Sealand is its own sovereign country. They have their own constitution, proudly fly their own flag, and had their own passport. That was, of course, until Versace's murderer was found possessing one in 1997, and Prince Roy immediately revoked all of the passports that had previously been issued. Prince Roy died in 2012, and his son Michael has assumed the title as the monarch of Sealand. After nearly 50 years, a tense court ruling, and a hostage situation, Sealand still proudly stands in the North Sea as the world's smallest country that isn't. Today we're taking a deep dive into the world of micronations. These small, self-proclaimed entities may not be recognized by any official sovereign state, but they're certainly worth exploring. From experimental political projects to artistic expressions, micronations are a fascinating phenomenon that have captivated people for decades. But what are micronations exactly? And what motivates people to create them? Let's dive in and explore the world of micronations and discover the unique stories, cultures, and people behind them. We will start with the oldest micronations and work our way to the newest, as there are currently 60 active micronations. Kingdom of Redonda a small uninhabited island in the Caribbean Sea, now legally part of Antigua and Barbuda. In 1865, a citizen of Montserrat was supposedly permitted by Queen Victoria to claim the title of King of Redonda, as long as he did not incite any revolt against colonial authority. Kingdom of Araucania and Patagonia After the fall of the kingdom and death of Orly Antoine, the title of King of Patagonia passed between various French citizens. The current king is Frederick Luz. Parva Domus, a self-declared centenary micronation surrounded by Uruguay that has functioned since 1878 as a social and recreational association that mimics the functioning of a real country. Since its foundation, it has had over 800,000 different naturalized citizens. Kingdom of Elor, a tongue-in-cheek micronation founded by a group of school teachers as a summer camp on the island of Elor, Denmark. Republic of Saugiais. An officially sanctioned tongue-in-cheek micronation located in eastern France, in the Department of Dieu. Free Borough of Longwest. The Free Borough of Longwest was a special privilege granted to the Welsh town of Longwest by the Prince of Wales. Longwest is now a small town and community on the River Conwy in Conwy County Borough, Wales. The town consequently has its own coat of arms and flag, and this is the origin of the old local motto Simru, Loger Longwest. Nation of Celestial Space, a micronation that comprises the entirety of the universe besides Earth. It was founded on January 1, 1949 by James T. Mangan to stop other countries from claiming outer space land. Principality of Saborga, a town in the Italian region of Liguria that claims never to have been a part of the modern Italian state. Republic of Jantland. The region of Jantland was self-governing from the 10th to 12th century. The Micronation Movement was founded in 1963 in order to preserve and promote the Jantlandic culture, language, and way of life. It has had three presidents, hosts festivals, and boasts its own national anthem. Republic of Rathnelly. A Toronto neighborhood declared itself an independent republic during the celebration of Canada's centennial on July 1, 1967. The Republic of Rathnelly elected a queen and celebrates Rathnelly Day biennially. Principality of Sealand, a World War II military facility consisting of a man-made structure located off the English coast that was occupied and declared to be an independent state by Patty Roy Bates. Freetown Christiania, Christiania, also known as Freetown Christiania, is a self-proclaimed autonomous neighborhood in the Danish capital of Copenhagen. The commune occupies the site of an old barracks and is home to almost 1,000 residents. Exivland, a micronation founded as a protest to the Israeli government for demolishing an illegally inhabited house. Founded by an Iranian-born Israeli named Eli Avivi and his wife, it was leased to him by the Israeli government for 99 years. Its name is derived from the nearby ancient city ruin of Exiv. He died of pneumonia in 2018. 
Natopia, introduced as a conceptual nation by John Lennon and Yoko Ono on April Fool's Day, Natopia has no land, no borders, and no passports or visas. Anyone declaring their awareness of Natopia's existence was allowed to join. It was founded partly as a way to satirize Lennon's immigration troubles at the time. Talasa dot a micronation founded as a bedroom kingdom by Milwaukee, Wisconsin resident Robert Ben Madison. Madison claims to have coined the term micronation. Grand Duchy of Avram, non-territorial micronation founded by an eccentric self-proclaimed Duke, John Rudge, who was later elected to the Tasmanian State Parliament. Empire of Atlantium, based in Australia, it advocates for global governance, specifically no borders and freedom of movement. Conk Republic, founded by then mayor of Key West, Florida, Dennis Wardlow, it claims tongue-in-cheek independence. The only way to fight stigma and shame is to shine light on it. Ask your healthcare provider if Big Tarvi is right for you and visit BigTarvi.com to view the important facts, including important warnings. better and better. It's from the United States in protest at a checkpoint established by the U.S. Border Patrol. Kingdom of North Dumpling, an island in Fishers Island, South Old, New York, declared independent after its owner Dean Kamen was denied permission to build a wind turbine on the island. Dominion of Melchizedek. The Dominion of Melchizedek is a micronation known largely for facilitating large-scale banking fraud in many parts of the world. Arakan Empire, an eccentric tongue-in-cheek micronation. It claims various terrestrial and interplanetary territories. Republic of Wangamomona, declared in protest of the township of Wangamomona switching regions after New Zealand's regional council boundaries were redrawn in 1989. Washita Nation. African-American group associated with the Moorish Science Temple of America who claimed to be a sovereign state of Native Americans within the boundaries of the United States of America. Nui Sloanish Kunst. Since 1991, the NSK has claimed to be a sovereign state of sorts, a claim similar to that of Micronations. 2017 saw NSK set up a pavilion at the Venice Biennale where Slave Oge Zizek stated that the uniqueness of NSK is this idea of the stateless state. Eldeland Vargaland, a conceptual art project by two Swedish artists, Carl Michael von Hauswolf and Leif Elgren, which defines itself as the borders of all nations. Kingdom of Enenkio claims Wake Atoll, a U.S. territory north of the Marshall Islands, and has been widely deemed a scam. Ladonia, a micronation founded by a group led by Swedish artist Lars Vilks as the home to sculptures created by him in the Kullaberg Nature Reserve in northwest Skane. Le Royaume de Lance saint jean It achieved a certain notoriety when its citizens held a referendum on January 21, 1997 to turn the village into Le Royaume de Lance saint jean the continent's first municipal monarchy. Kingdom of Wallachia, a tongue-in-cheek micronation founded in 1997 as an elaborate practical joke, located in the northeast corner of the Czech Republic. Holy Empire of Reunion a micronation founded by Brazilian law students as a political simulation. Reunion has a very active political system. It has issued passports, minted coins, and is considered one of the most important Lusophone micronations. The micronation has been portrayed by the media of dozens of countries and has been the star of a front-page article of Reunion Island newspaper, which used it to trace a parallel between its independence and the idea of having independence from France. Republic of Uzupis. Uzupis is a neighborhood largely located in the old town of Vilnius, Lithuania. In 1997, the residents of the area declared a Republic of Uzupis with its own flag, currency, president, and constitution. Maritime Republic of Eastport. The Maritime Republic of Eastport, commonly known as simply Eastport, is a seaside neighborhood community and tongue-in-cheek micronation located in Annapolis, Maryland, in the U.S. 
Nova Roma, an international organ of Roman revivalists who claim to be a modern Roman nation and have the administrative structure of the ancient Roman Republic. Nova Roma explicitly states that they are not a micronation but a civitas or residential publica. Their organ, however, fits all the requirements for being classified as such. New Utopia, a proposed micronation based on libertarian principles to be built on platforms in the Caribbean Sea. It was founded by American entrepreneur Lazarus Long. The project's status as of 2006 is in question. Republic of Malaysia, a micronation founded by Kevin Baugh, occupying his semi-rural residential acreage in Nevada. It is run humorously as a dictatorial banana republic. Global Country of World Peace. GCWP is a nonprofit organization that claims to promote transcendental meditation, education, and the construction of buildings for peace in the world's major cities. The organization made several attempts to create its own state in different parts of the world. Republic of Vivkani. During the war in Yugoslavia, an independent committee was established in the village of Vivkani, which was threatened by ethnic conflict in what was then communist Macedonia. After the situation had calmed down, the committee joined independent Macedonia and in 2000 the inhabitants again declared independence as a micronation to promote tourism. Grand Duchy of Westarctica. Duchy of Westarctica is an Antarctic micronation established in 2001 that claims the territory known as Marie Bird Land. Hajduka Republica Majadatamica, a protest project started by a local because of inefficiency of problems with the local electricity supply. Principality of Sn Wix gives you the power of AI to build the website you need with full business functionality and a design tailored. They kill. A family of Australian residents could no longer afford to pay taxes, and after litigation over a mortgage and being inspired by the Principality of Hutt River, they did legal research and came to the conclusion that forming a country would be completely legal under Australian law, and thus they declared independence on September 2, 2003. Kingdom of Lovely, a nation created by comedian Danny Wallace as part of his BBC series, How to Start Your Own Country. Principality of W.Y. established by Paul Delprat during a dispute with the local council of Mossman Municipality in Sydney over the construction of a driveway to his property. Dominion of British West Florida, a micronation intending to revive the former British colony of the same name. Zakistan, a small tract of land in Box Elder County, a remote part of Utah, on which its owner, Zach Landsberg, has built monuments. It has also issued passports. Naminara Republic. Nami Island is home to the Naminara Republic, a self-declared micronation described as the tourist destination that advocates the concept of a nation. On July 20, 2018, a retired M48 Patton tank was received from the Republic of Korea Armed Forces. Austinasia, a self-declared sovereign state based in the United Kingdom. Grand Duchy of Flandrensis, an Antarctic micronation that seeks to draw attention to environmental concerns, founded by Niels Vermeers. Sovereign State of Forvik, an islet in Shetland, Scotland, declared a crown dependency by Stuart Hill as part of a Shetland secessionist agenda. Wordland, Wordland is an experiment into the legitimacy and self-sustainability of a country without its own soil, which transcends national borders without breaching or lessening the sovereignty of any involved dogs. Principality of Aigues a micronation that claims the French city of Aigues Together with local merchants and the touristic office of Aigues they created the BPAM to handle currency exchange with the local currency, the Flamand. Principality of Filetino, created by the mayor of Filetino in protest at the Italian government's austerity measure that reorganized the local government of towns with less than 1,000 residents. Romanov Empire, the imperial throne was founded by Russian businessman Anton Bakov as the Russian Empire. By its constitution, it is a federal constitutional monarchy and the successor of the empire founded by Peter I. Murawari Republic, a micronation that is the traditional homeland of an aboriginal nation. It declared its independence from Australia. Sovereign Yudinji Government, a micronation that is the traditional homeland of an aboriginal nation. It declared its independence from Australia. Glacier Republic, founded by Greenpeace activists in a disputed border region of the Andes between Chile and Argentina, for the purpose of drawing attention to Chile's lack of environmental protection for glaciers. Free Republic of Liberland, 
claims an uninhabited parcel of disputed land on the western bank of the Danube known as Sega, between Croatia and Serbia. It was created by Czech politician and activist Vit Jedlica. Principality of Las, Micronation Promoting Tourism. Esgardia, a micronation founded by Igor Ashurbali that aims to launch satellites into space in order to found a real nation recognized by the UN. The ultimate aim is to avoid the restrictions of the current space law framework. Principality of Islandia. The Principality of Islandia is an incipient micronation that claims the small Belizean island of Coffee Cay as its territory. It is a crowdfunded effort. Lamb Island. Lamb is a small uninhabited island measuring approximately 100 by 50 meters in the Firth of Forth, off the east coast of Scotland. It was purchased by Yuri Geller in 2009. In 2022, Geller declared the island a micronation. Geller offers citizenship, with proceeds going to save a child's heart, an Israeli charity. That's all for today's exploration of the world of micronations. From Redonda to Natopia, these self-proclaimed entities are a fascinating blend of art, culture, and political expression. Although not officially recognized by any sovereign state, these micronations offer a unique perspective on the human desire for self-determination and individuality. Interesting stuff, right? You think we can do it? Create our own micronation with our own set of rules and become recognized? <laughs> Now, if you think that this is something only confined to Earth, <laughs> you'd be highly mistaken. Check out these videos. Roughly 280 miles over our heads right now, circling the Earth once every 93 minutes, is Asgardia 1, the capital of the micronation, Asgardia. Igor Asherbaly isn't your average micronationalist. He was born in Azerbaijan on September 9, 1963, amidst the ever-intensifying space race between the Soviet Union and the United States. By the time he was an adult, Igor was living in Moscow and was a heavy hitter in the Russian science community. In 2010, he was awarded Russia's State Science and Technology Prize. In 2013, he founded the Aerospace International Research Center in Vienna, Austria. And in 2016, he was awarded the Gold UNESCO Medal for contributions to the development of nanoscience and nanotechnologies. So Igor has quite a bit of street cred in the scientific community, which was certainly helpful in getting his latest project, the space nation of Asgardia, off the ground. And we have ignition. On November 12, 2017, Cygnus CRS-OA-8E launched from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport on Wallops Island, Virginia. The craft, named the SS Gene Cernan in honor of the Celestia passport holder and last man to walk on the moon, carried with it 7,359 pounds of cargo, including a six-pound CubeSat known as Asgardia-1. On December 6th, the SS Cernan released the 4x4x8 cube into low Earth orbit, where it is expected to stay until its orbit decays in November of 2022. Asgardia now claims that it's the first nation to have all of its territory in space. Despite its territory being in space, Asgardia's government and population exist terrestrially, with its headquarters located in Vienna, Austria. Chapter 3, Article 6 of the Asgardian Constitution states that anyone over the age of 18 who agrees to the Asgardian Constitution and consciously submits his or her personal data to Asgardia's space database may become an Asgardian citizen. And many have accepted this offer. As of this recording, Asgardia's website lists their population at 1,039,214, 50,000 more people than Iceland, Belize, and Barbados combined. So I think the obvious question here is, why? What would possess a man to pour a ton of money into trying to establish a nation in space? Well, for starters, Igor is a billionaire. So he has the disposable income to launch disposable metal containers into space. And he cites some altruistic reasons for investing in a nation amongst the stars. One of the goals of Asgardia is to create a planetary defense constellation to protect Earth against asteroids, solar flares, and human-manufactured space junk. But some cynics see other motivations. It has been theorized that one goal for Asgardia is for it to become an outer space tax haven for fellow billionaires. And then there's the clause in the Constitution where citizens forfeit their private data, which has led people to wonder if that's really what this is all about. In reality, it's probably a combination of all of those reasons. But who wouldn't want to be the president of a nation in space if they had the means to do so? In 1980, a man named Dennis Hope was going through some hard times. He was broke and in the middle of a divorce. One night, he looked up to the sky, saw the moon, and had an idea. He did some research which led him to the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. This treaty essentially serves as the foundation of space law and bars the placing of weapons of mass destruction in orbit of the Earth, on the Moon, or any other celestial body, while also prohibiting any weapons testing or military maneuvers of any kind in outer space. However, the key piece of information that Dennis Hope found was buried in Article 2. 
Article 2 states that outer space is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty or by any other means. So, basically, no country can own outer space. But Hope noticed that the treaty didn't say anything about individuals owning property in space, and thought of a way to capitalize on this fact. He wrote out a declaration of ownership to the United Nations, as well as the governments of the United States and Soviet Union, claiming all of the planets in the solar system, along with their moons, with the intention of subdividing them and selling the property to anybody who wanted it. In the letter, Hope said that if the United Nations had any legal objection to this, then they needed to contact him. Unsurprisingly, Hope's declaration of ownership was ignored, which Hope took as legal validation of his claim. Hope subsequently founded the Lunar Embassy and began selling off plots of land to anyone interested in owning a piece of space. By 1995, outer space real estate was Hope's full-time job. In 1996, Hope received a letter from a German pensioner from Westphalia named Martin Jurgens. Jurgen stated simply, the moon belongs to my family since July 15, 1756. King Frederick the Great may best be known for navigating the Prussians through the Seven Years' War, but another fact about the old Fritz is that he claimed ownership of the skies, including the moon. Frederick was stricken with gout throughout much of his adult life, and he would often visit a farmer in the north named Aul Jurgens, who was said to have been blessed as a healer. Frederick was so grateful to Jurgens for his help throughout the war that, as a gift, he gave him the moon. Frederick even had a deed written to make it official, leaving the moon to be passed down the Jurgens family for generations, until eventually landing with Martin. Indignant over the fact that Dennis Hope was profiting off of his family's property, Martin Jurgens went to his government in hopes of invalidating Hope's lunar embassy. In January of 1997, the Institute of Air and Space Law in Cologne determined that Frederick the Great never owned the moon in the first place, and thus the title deed given to the Jurgens family was invalid. Although this was a major blow to Martin Jurgens' case, it simultaneously invalidated Dennis Hope's claims of ownership and ability to sell plots of land on the moon. But Hope continued selling, and people continued buying. In 2001, Hope founded a democratic republic nation called the Galactic Government to protect all of the celestial property that he had claimed. A constitution was drafted and ratified in March of 2004, at which point the company had 3.7 million property owners. Little did Hope know, another celestial nation had already been in existence. James Thomas Mangan of Evergreen Park, Illinois, was known as an eccentric public relations man, a best-selling author, and the proud owner of outer space. A man ahead of his time, Mangan registered a claim of ownership of outer space with the Recorder of Deeds and Titles in Cook County, Illinois, on January 1, 1949, eight years prior to the launch of Sputnik. Mangan proclaimed outer space the nation of celestial space, or Celestia for short, on behalf of all of humanity. His goal was not to colonize or conquer, but to instead ensure that outer space was free from political hegemony. He also sought to ban the use of outer space for nuclear testing, a concern that would be echoed in the aforementioned Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Once the United States and Soviet Union began launching objects and humans into his territory, Mangan began sending angry letters to the leaders of the respective nations, claiming that they were trespassing on property of Celestia. Mangan would eventually ease up on his claims of trespassing, and even issued passports to astronauts, including John Glenn and Gene Sermon, the last man to walk on the moon. To this day, stamp and coin collectors keep a sharp eye out for Nation of Celestial Space stamps and gold celestions, the currency of Celestia. James Thomas Mangan passed away in 1970, and the Nation of Celestial Space seems to have died with him. That's likely why Dennis Hope did not receive an angry letter from Celestia when he began selling space real estate 10 years later. Hope continues to operate the Lunar Embassy and Galactic Government and sells extraterrestrial real estate to this day. As of 2013, the Lunar Embassy had sold 611 million acres of land on the Moon, 325 million acres on Mars, and a combined 125 million acres on Venus, Io, and Mercury. But now there's a new space nation emerging that could compete with Dennis Hope and his real estate claims. But that's a topic for a future video. Whether or not Dennis Hope, King Frederick the Great, the Jurgens family, or Celestia own out our space has never really mattered on the world stage. But with Earthlings nearing the event horizon of commercial space travel, decisions of who owns what in space could become all the more pressing. But as far as the Lunar Embassy and Galactic Government are concerned, any extraterrestrial real estate transactions will have to go through them. So listen, let's just say we wanted to create the Champagne City. We wanted to create our own micronation for us. Champagne gang, Fizz fam, for our confidants, how in the world would we accomplish this? We need a name, we need a flag, but what else would we need to be recognized? Check this out. Do you ever just feel 
blessed. When my buddy Canubis told me I would be talking about micronations today, I was, I was, I was ready. By the way, hi, my name is Dear Sam. I'm here on behalf of Canubis and I'll be talking about micronations today. I have given many minutes of my life to staring at maps, following borderlines and seeking out microscopic islands in the middle of nowhere on Google Maps when I'm supposed to be working. When I was in school, I made the mistake of taking geography at GCSE, so I had triple geography every Monday morning without fail. That was my nightmarish reality, however I am more than willing, 10 years on, to rekindle that love by asking the question that you've already seen by now in the title. Are micronations real countries? Well, since I'm pretty into my words, I should probably uh, start with the uh, definition of what a country is. That'd be good, wouldn't it? And that is a nation with its own government occupying a particular territory. We are discussing the micro editions of nations, so let's just chuck that definition in as well. A large body of people united by common descent, history, culture, or language inhabiting a particular state or territory. So this early on in the video, it is important to clarify that while the two of them are synonyms, uh, a country and a nation are still two separate entities with the capabilities of coming together. While we're on the synonyms, we should probably have a quick look at those. I said quick. Life's short, be a pedant. I am going to look at those more in depth in a second, I'm not Satan. But first of all, let's just have a quick nosy at the Micronations Wikipedia page. A micronation sometimes referred to as a model country or new country project is an entity that claims to be an independent nation or state but is not recognized by world governments or major international organizations. So what we can garner from this information is that micronations say they're countries but the bigger ones don't exactly agree. I am making a video on micronations so I should probably show you the list. Wow. Wow, there's a lot. Well, at least they're recognized somewhere. A lot of micronations have gone the extra mile when it comes to sort of cementing their own individual identity, like minting their own currency, making their own uniforms, and their own flags. I love flags. Oh, there's so many good ones. Also, have you seen the uniform of the Arrogant Empire's dictator? It is everything we have decided to stand. Looking back at the definitions that Google and Wikipedia gave us, I did notice a couple of similarities. For example, some form of definitive leader, an established government, and people who are united by a certain identity identity. But is that all you need? Well, there's also this super useful checklist from the Montevideo Convention in 1933, written by people who know a lot more about this than I do. Obviously, yes, this document is 85 years old at the time of recording, and things are always constantly subject to change. However, many countries do still follow these four basic rules, and I'd really like to keep this video under the 10 minute mark, so we're using them too. So if the world's governments are not recognizing micronations as legitimate actual nations, it would be fair to assume that they obviously don't meet the requirements to be considered an actual country. I'm not going to assume, I'm a guest. That'd be rude. I am hosting though, so let's just play a cheeky game for a minute, shall we? So here we have the four very important points of the Montevideo Convention, but how many of our micro buddies actually meet all four of them? That was, that was quicker than expected. I noticed pretty early on when going through the list that the fourth rule in particular was a definitive make or breaker when it came to micronations. Because micronations aren't recognized by other countries, there is no capacity for them to enter into relations with them. In fact, the only recognition micronations receive are from other micronations, so it doesn't count. However, when it comes to deciding who is what, it is much less about logical reasoning and a lot more about politics. Queen Anastasia of Ruritania, a micronation enclaved in the United States, described micronations as a political statement and a direct response to how they felt things were being run in their countries of origin. A lot of people on the outside believe that all of these micronational leaders are just role playing, which is understandably something they hate a lot because it carries with it the implication that what they're doing is not to be taken seriously. Many of the countries we reside in today and had drilled into our brains in good old geography class were also very heavily contested at the time that they were made. So honestly speaking, it doesn't come as any surprise that micronations are currently receiving the same treatment. We are at a point in history where the political climate is possibly the fiercest it's ever been. But the difference is less and less people are afraid of taking a stand. You know what countries are? complicated. Some are still fighting over land and borders, some are judged solely on their defense strategies, and some are just straight, straight chilling. So to summarize, if no already recognized country recognizes a micronation as its own country, it's not a country. That is probably the simplest, easiest definition there is at the moment. I'm not gonna say concise, nothing I do is concise. Are micronations nations? I'd say so. They're united by a number of things, and that is what a nation is defined as. But are they countries? 
Not yet. However, in the last 30 years, some countries have changed their names, some new countries have been born, and some just want to update their friendship circle. So it's not exactly big news that the world is constantly subject to change. I mean, the heck, some countries we know and love are still not recognized by everyone. Maybe in the next 30 years or so, these little guys will get the recognition they've been after. Hey noobs, how'd, how'd I do? The world map is reassuringly solid, with clear, thick black lines to let you know what's one thing and what's not that one thing. It appears so fixed, people are willing to get it tattooed onto their skin, presumably so they can then colour in the countries they visit to show everyone how cultured and worldly and annoying they are. But of course, the world map does change as new countries spring into existence. The most recent examples include Timor-Leste in 2002, Montenegro in 2006, and... South Sudan in 2011. The good news is, anybody can claim a country. All you have to do is say, this is mine. The bad news is, getting the rest of the world to agree with you is mega hard. We're going to have a look at what separates those who have been successful from those that have been not, or unsuccessful. And few people have been more not successful than Englishman Stuart Hill, who in February 2011 founded the country of Forvik. Stuart Hill's story begins during a failed attempt to circumnavigate Great Britain in a rowing boat with a wind sail stuck in it. After eight expensive rescue call-outs, Stuart wound up in hospital in the Shetland Islands, from where he soon discovered the tiny uninhabited island of Forvik. Stuart liked Forvik so much, he set his sights on being the supreme ruler of it. After doing lots of careful reading into the history of the Shetland Islands, he summarised what he read into a dubious argument, that they were technically still part of the old Norse Empire, not Scotland, and therefore Forvik was free to claim. First Minister, Stuart Hill. Population, Stuart Hill. Name, Stuart Hill. Stuart was so convinced of Forvik sovereignty, he refused to pay vehicle tax and was sent to prison. Stuart issued a statement saying, I'm right and they're wrong. Stuart Hill. Although his country has a flag and a website, Forvik remains part of Scotland on all world maps. Except those drawn by Stuart. So how do you go about creating a new country that appears on everyone else's world maps? The thing you need to get most maps to give you a thick black outline is a seat of the United Nations, the international body that agrees international things. But how do you get that seat? Whose email address do you need? Should you sign off yours sincerely or yours faithfully and will that make the difference? The UN have a strict set of requirements all applicants have to meet in order to be considered. The first of which is... Do you have a historical connection to the land? Is this where Stuart, an Englishman claiming part of Scotland, went wrong? What if Stuart's family had lived on Forvik for thousands of years? Is an ancestral link enough to convince the UN you're a country? Let's look at an example that answers that very question. The Black Hills of northern USA have been the ancestral lands of the Lakota Native Americans for centuries. And in 1868, the US government recognised this in a treaty that promised the land to the Lakota forever. But forever did not, it turned out, mean until we find gold, which happened shortly after. The Lakota were offered compensation of half a billion dollars for the stolen territory, but they've always refused the money, insisting their ancestral lands are not for sale. In 2007, the Lakota of Dakota declared an independent nation of Lakota, breaking away from the United States, taking with them the giant faces of four American presidents in a mountain. With the legal treaty providing indisputable evidence that the Lakota technically owned the land, surely the UN would make good straight away and confirm a shiny new country. Unfortunately for them, their colonizer also happened to be the richest country in the world, with enormous influence on what does and doesn't get ratified. America looked at their proposal, thought very hard, and said no. And absolutely nobody was surprised. Hard evidence in the form of clear documentation wasn't enough to get independence. But consider this example from the other side of the planet, a claim to independence based on a lack of documentation. The Murrawari Aborigines have never accepted that their land officially belongs to Australia. Nobody ever signed a treaty with them, beat them in a war, or even so much as set foot in their territory when Australia was founded. In March 2013, the Murrawari wrote a letter to the Prime Minister of Australia and the Queen of England, head of state in Australia, long story, asking to see documents proving that Australia were their rightful owners. After 21 days, the Murrawari decided to interpret the ensuing silence as recognition. In March 2013, they formally declared the continuance of their statehood and asked the UN to recognise a new country twice the size of Denmark. But without any real geopolitical power behind them, the UN just loudly ignored their declaration, to this day leaving Australia in charge of collecting Murrawari bins. So sometimes you need to do more than politely submit a proposal. The UN might also consider, have you fought any lengthy or bloody civil wars? If you want to make the UN really sit up and pay attention, you need what's creepily referred to as a monopoly over violence, or total military control. This can be a surefire route to recognition. Examples include Bangladesh, Venezuela, the USA, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, India, Pakistan, Algeria, Latvia, Namibia and Portugal, to name but 12. A more recent and more ongoing example can be found in East Africa. 
When ex-British Somaliland got independence in the 60s, they joined with their ex-Italian neighbours to become one happy Horn of African country. <laughs> This happiness quickly became unhappiness under a brutal dictatorship. And, following a devastating civil war, Somaliland once again declared independence in 1991. Today, Somaliland have their own separate military, passports, even currency. Somaliland sent a request to the UN asking for their seal of approval, but despite fitting all the criteria for becoming a new country, the UN still hasn't lifted a finger. It doesn't help that other African nations refuse to acknowledge Somaliland's independence. Countries like Mali and Morocco, with separatist movements of their own, are terrified of an independence domino effect. So Somaliland remains in limbo as an autonomous region of Somalia. Despite its clearly enforced border, Google Maps doesn't even bother with a dotted line, let alone a solid one. Why is it so hard to get the attention of the UN? How come Somaliland didn't manage it, but South Sudan did? South Sudan successfully became the world's newest proper recognised by the UN country in July 2011. Exactly like Somaliland, they had a historical claim to their land, fought a civil war, and were just as politically obscure in the eyes of the world's richest countries. So what was that final missing piece that made the UN pay attention? Hello, I'm George Clooney, and I think South Sudan should be a new country. Ah, ah that's why. Course. Hollywood humanitarian George Clooney has been raising awareness about the plight of the Sudanese ever since the Darfur conflict in the mid-2000s. Nobody cares about Sudan. I said I'm George Clooney, and I can make people care about South Sudan because I say I care. I mean, because I do care. I'm not acting now, this is real. Damn it. Oh my god, you are George Clooney, winner of an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. Sudan in two, you say? Consider it done. I'm a hero! And therein lies the lesson for Stuart Hill. What he should have done was get Reese Witherspoon to do a tweet about Forvik's cruel subjugation by the British, and he just might have got somewhere. Around the world, there are but dozens more examples of are they or aren't they countries. Many behave exactly like countries, with passports, governments and currencies, and whilst not having a comfy chair at the United Nations, do still feature on the maps of their political allies, Palestine, Taiwan and Kosovo, to name but two and a half. Despite the UN being a very popular method by which to judge the countryness of a country, at the end of the day, there's no such thing as official. The world map looks different depending on which country you're looking at it in, and countryness will always be a grey area. Does that mean I can declare my half of the desk an independent country? Yes, but I'd only invade. And I deserve it. Jay! Hi. Where have you been? It's 2.04 in the afternoon, which means there's only... Six minutes until Countdown starts on Channel 4. I know. The thing is, Jay, I know how much you love Countdown and how important it is to you that we both watch it every single day. And compare our scores afterwards. And compare our scores afterwards, of course. And I love that, I do. But today, I can't. Why? I'm in Hawaii. What? I've gone to Hawaii, and very sadly, that means I can't watch Countdown with you. I don't understand. Well, you can't watch Channel 4 outside the UK, so I'll have to pass and just enjoy the sun. But you can just use Surfshark. What? Surfshark. It's a VPN, an app and browser extension that lets you virtually place your phone, laptop, tablet, or TV in any country. With Surfshark... Good. <laughs> Thing is, Jay, I'm... I'm... So there you have it. This micronation thing is interesting, isn't it? So do y'all think we can create our own champagne city? What would we name our micronation? What would the official pet be for our micronation? I'm thinking a dog, because I'm a dog lover. <laughs> so would the official pet of the champagne city be a dog, a bird, maybe a lion? But yeah, obtaining one of those might be a problem. What would the flag look like? I'm serious, y'all, because I'm tired of these Americas. I'm tired. I'm tired of the world. And whether or not it's accepted by the UN or not, doesn't matter as long as you have your own space that you can call your own, where you can be at peace without outside chaos. That's all that matter, right? So let me know what y'all think about this. Drop in the comments and let me know what you think about Micronation. Did you know about them? Would you be interested in starting one? If you had enough land, would you start a Micronation in your backyard and declare yourself the supreme ruler? <laughs> Drop in the comments and let me know. Consider hitting that like button for me. Consider joining the Champagne Gang and the Fizz Fam so that you can be a part when we start our nation. <laughs> Hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you'll be notified when we jump into whichever sector we jump into for another show. Consider supporting the channel. The Cash App is on the screen. It would be greatly appreciated. And as always, confidants, always remember, if it doesn't cause you to elevate, it's causing you to depreciate. Now raise those glasses, clink, and let's drink till we meet again. Ta-ta.